Hi class, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you had a great long weekend. We're into the final stretch of the class now. We got about a week and a half left, about five days of lecture. And so we're going to embark now on something that I think uh, I certainly have always had in the back of my mind as we've gone into our study of astrobiology, which is what is going to be the case for and what are the opportunities for and how do we go about searching for extraterrestrial intelligence as opposed to just any form of life we might find like microbes, which is what we've mostly been talking about. So we're gonna start with that discussion today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about what uh, we mean by intelligence and start talking about some of the challenges. It'll take almost the rest of the quarter to get through all the topics uh, related to that. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this section. This is the last two chapters of the book for those of you who are keeping up on your reading. Okay, so in the background here for this half of today's lecture is a picture of the Harold Washington Library in downtown Chicago. Uh, it is certainly one of the most gorgeous buildings in Chicago for those of you who are architecture buffs. Um, it takes up an entire city block, uh, so it's quite a large library. And if you haven't visited it uh, during your time here at Northwestern, you should certainly go down and take a look. Um, libraries, I think, embody one of our notions that many of us carry in our heads about what we mean by knowledge. They are the embodiment of what we humans do with knowledge, which is we collect it and we put it in one place so that we can all share in it. And I think that is certainly an indicator of intelligence, um, but I think it's probably also, to my mind, more an indicator of how we view our society as opposed to pure intelligence. But nevertheless, uh, I think it uh, fits well with today's theme. So uh, if you haven't visited, uh, please do uh, take the opportunity to go visit uh, when we're all back together again in Chicago. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And what we're going to start with is a discussion of what we mean by intelligence. That's certainly the hardest part of this, as uh, the hardest part of everything uh, during this course has been defining what we mean, right? We started this whole course by, by asking, what do we mean by life, and realizing that's a really hard question to answer. Well, what we're going to uh, discuss here today is, uh, what do we mean by intelligence, and that also is a really hard question to answer. Um, so uh, here for the image, many of you have probably noticed, um, I like silhouettes of people against the night sky. Um, certainly astronomy is a very empowering uh, activity. And if you do have the opportunity to go out and look at the night sky, uh, whether it's in the context of a course or just for your own personal enjoyment, I think uh, having some exposure to astronomy, both in terms of the visceral personal experience of viewing the sky like these folks are doing here in this picture, or in terms of the kind of big picture ideas like we discussed in the class are all good things for all of us. It kind of puts a lot of our human endeavors and a lot of our human struggles in a kind of harsh perspective maybe is the right way to think about it. So anyway, so we're gonna to talk today about intelligent life. And so I wanna start with this part of the lecture, just talking about what are the challenges with both defining and searching for intelligent life. That'll set the framework up for the next several lectures. We'll talk about examples of intelligent life here on Earth, and then we'll talk uh, very specifically for a couple of examples about technology and communication, okay? So there are many challenges that you and I can imagine, and we can make a long list of what the challenges are in uh, finding intelligent life in the cosmos. But I think by and large, these are the big brass tacks. These are the main ones that we're gonna have to overcome if we're ever going to discover whether or not there's intelligent life out there in the universe besides us. The first one, uh, which we'll talk about today, are these two uh, blocks here, which are how do we recognize intelligence? What do we mean when we use the word intelligence? And then also, how do you actually get, get the attention of an intelligent species somewhere else in the, in the cosmos, or equivalently, maybe not equivalently, but in addition, how do you establish contact with them? Uh, we'll talk uh, in future lectures about the format of communications um, and how you talk about uh, uh, the conveyance of information, how you go about deciphering information. We'll touch on that a little bit today, but that'll be a primary focus of one of our future uh, lectures, okay? So answering what is intelligence is almost as hard, if not harder, than answering what is life. 
And just as was the case when we first started asking the question, what is life? I think one of the kind of default views is, well, we'll know it when we see it. Because we certainly look around here on Earth and it's clear that there are things we think are intelligent and things that we think are not intelligent. But even with our own species, I think this question is hard to answer. And so as an example, let's consider uh, Admiral Grace Hopper here. So Admiral Grace Hopper is arguably one of the smartest people who lived in the 20th century. She had a PhD in mathematics from Yale. Um, she was a naval officer uh, and uh, in fact the first female uh, admiral in the Navy, I think, uh, at the time she was promoted to rear admiral. Uh, the Navy recalled her from retirement. She tried to retire in 1966 and they re uh, recalled her to work on the burgeoning uh, development of computer technology in the military. And so uh, this was well outside the bounds of regulations. They had to get special dispensation for Congress uh, in order to do that. And they kept her in service or she stayed in service uh, until 1986, a full 20 years after she had tried to retire from the Navy the first time. When she retired, she was the oldest active duty member in the Navy. Uh, she retired in 1986 at an age of 79. Now, she is well known for being uh, in the leadership of the team that developed COBOL. Those of you who have some exposure to CS will recognize COBOL as an old-fashioned computer language, but it was actually one of the most remarkable developments in computer technology in history. It was the first high-level language used, developed, for programming computers. Up to the time before COBOL was developed, everyone programmed computers by putting in all the ones and zeros by hands, what we call machine language or assembly language. And uh, Hopper was a big proponent of the idea that computer programming should be a lot like writing English sentences. And so she advocated and guided the development of the early computer languages of which COBOL was the first. She was also the director of UNIVAC Programming and Development. Uh, the UNIVAC, uh, for those of you who know your computer history, this is all a good exercise in winning a trivial pursuit, right? Uh, the UNIVAC computer was the first mainframe computer designed for business applications. And so it is arguably one of the computers that first made the transition into the idea that computers were going to become part of ordinary society as opposed to just be a piece of the military. Uh, famously, uh, there's lots of folklore about, about uh, Dr. Hopper, but uh, famously, her team was the team that discovered the first bug in the Mark II computer at Harvard in 1947. And if you know about this story, this is a picture from their journal. Uh, the bug was a moth, which they taped into the journal. You can see it there. This is down in the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, it was found in Relay 70 of Panel F. Uh, and as you can see there in their notes, it was the first actual case of a bug being found in the computer. And uh, so this, was, uh, this is one of the stories she was famous for. So, so arguably, I think Grace Hopper is an example of what we all aspire to be, a smart person, right? Someone who is clearly identified as being intelligent. Okay, well, what about this guy? Does anyone know this guy? This guy is Felix Baumgartner. Now, do you think he's intelligent? Well, you may or may not, because he's the guy who in October of 2012 skydived from 127,000 feet. He held the world record in skydiving until 2015 uh, when a Google executive uh, broke it from 138,000 feet. So this is a picture of Felix just before he made the jump. Uh, you can go watch his jump on YouTube. It's a really fun video to watch. He had a little cam with him so you could watch the whole fall. He had ground cameras watching him the whole nine yards. He broke the sound barrier on his way down. He reached Mach 1.25 on his descent. Okay. Now, you may think that that's a crazy stunt. And so clearly Felix is not altogether up here. Okay, so that would be example of, is that intelligent? Are you risking your life? Uh, that doesn't seem very smart, right? But at the same time, if you look at what they had to do, you had to look at the planning, you had to look at the physics, you had to look at the spacecraft that he went up in there, you look at his suit, all of that is clear signs of intelligence, right? So intelligence is really hard to define because it's not just raw knowledge, then it's also not just what you do with that knowledge, right? The combination of the two, we somehow put a value on when we judge intelligence. And this is one of the things that's going to be really hard for us when we start imagining talking to intelligences out there in the cosmos, is that the values that we go into that uh, search with are human values. And so it's not necessarily clear that we're going to understand, be able to communicate with, be able to interpret or relate to any intelligences we might encounter in our search. 
okay? We can't even figure it out here on Earth among ourselves because some of us think, well, Felix here was pretty smart. Others of us would be like, well, that was pretty dumb. That's not really intelligent at all, okay? So, so this kind of illustrates the point. So let's ask a slightly different question. Let's ask the question of, in astrobiology, what do we mean by the word intelligent? And so in this case, I think we can usually reduce the question of intelligence to we're asking about two primary features. The first one is this, technology. Can a life form build machines? Can a life form use their knowledge of science and mathematics and engineering to harness and control energy? Okay, now what you do with those machines is a completely different story, but the reason that we think of it this way when we're thinking about it in the context of astrobiology is because what we're actually heading towards is can this species that we imagine might be out there that we might communicate with, can it use technology to transmit or receive signals with us? Okay, and so that means machines, at least in the history of Earth. It went from early machines, like these kind of industrial revolution size building scale uh, machines with pulleys and gears and steam engines on it, uh, to the kinds of machines we have today, which are cell phones and radio telescopes and stuff like that. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, but then the second one is really, are you communicative? Okay, do you have a well-established form of communication? Uh, and what we mean by that is, can ideas be expressed and captured? Can they be shared uh, either among members of your own species or we hope with species off your world, namely us or us with you? Um, and can you understand and communicate information and ideas in a clear and concise way? Okay, and we'll come back to that point in a couple of lectures uh, when we talk about what information is actually useful to communicate or not. Okay, so we clearly uh, have ideas about communication on Earth. Uh, you and I are certainly communicating right now with language, spoken language, okay? And if you're looking at the slides with written language, uh, over here in the picture on this slide, there's clearly written language. There's a piece of technology. There's multiple pieces of technology there. There's paper, there's fountain pens. You're viewing it on a computer, okay? But the communication is a written system of writing in this case, uh, English and English alphabets. Uh, and there is actually a second uh, form of communication hidden there. Uh, these words that uh, are written are actually uh, the lyrics to a song. Those of you who are familiar with the movie Back to the Future will recognize this as being uh, The Power of Love by Huey Lewis and the News. Okay, so music is a separate kind of communication that uh, we'll, we'll come back to and talk to uh, eventually. Okay, so in astrobiology, these are the two things we're talking about, technology and communication, because those are the things that ultimately we think we're going to rely on to communicate with another species. So that's what we're going to use as the foundation for what we mean when we say the word intelligent. Okay? So let's talk about technological intelligence. So humans, I think, on Earth are the prima facta example of a technologically intelligent species. Um, we use and have used tools uh, throughout human history. So tool use in the archeological record goes back uh, for humans about two and a half million years uh, uh, to the early stone age of humans where uh, the first simple tools were used. We'll talk about the stone age again in a minute. Um, the control of fire, which is generally part of tool use, uh, dates with humans about a million years back in the archeological record. Uh, the, the uses of fire are many, but uh, in particular in relation to tools, like this tool that you see here, one of the things we saw fire used early on uh, was in heating stone uh, so that when you chip stone into a different kind of tool, uh, it flaked in appropriate ways, okay? Um, but about 250,000 years ago, we started seeing shape tools like the ones that you see here in the hand. Uh, so things that were uh, like knives, uh, spear tips, arrow tips, things like that, those all started appearing in the archaeological record about a quarter of a million years ago, okay? And of course, this kind of technology eventually grew to the technology that we have today. Uh, it led to improved hunting, it ultimately led to agriculture, agriculture led to cities, cities led to, you know, uh, um, uh, modern civic systems like sewers and roads and you know it led to all the things that we have around us today okay now despite the fact that we are the kind of poster child for um uh technology 
there are other examples of technology use in nature. Okay, and so the classic example are crows. Okay, so there's about 12 different bird species that do what crows do so well. Okay, but crows are really the, the, the prime movers here. Crows use sticks as tools. Okay, so you can see there, these are Hawaiian crows. Uh, so that crow up there at the top has a stick. It carries it around with it, and they use them to extract insects from burrows and crevices in logs and sticks. Okay, so that is an example of a tool use. The crow actually picks up the stick. It uses it for a specific purpose that is not just to have the stick. Now, we have uh, crows in captivity. We have tested them. Uh, and they are actually much more sophisticated than just carrying a stick around. We've seen crows turn uh, uh, malleable sticks into hooks and use hooks to fish things out of crevices. Uh, we've seen crows put multiple sticks together with uh, sticky material. If we put a, 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 a set, set of short sticks in them and then something really far away, they will assemble the sticks into a compound tool in order to reach the distant object. So crows clearly have some ability to manipulate objects into technological machines of a sort. Okay, and arguably these are the same sorts of things we probably did as early humans. Okay, so technological intelligence is much broader than just humans. We have a tendency to think of technology as being our screens and our computers and our light bulbs, but it's actually uh, much, much simpler than that. Probably one of the most famous recent examples of technological intelligence is if we look at the behavior of many different uh, species of great apes and monkeys, in particular chimpanzees and macaques, which are shown here, as well as capuchin monkeys, uh, we see them using stone tools. In particular, they're using stone hammers, often half their body weight or more, which is a clear indicator that they're using it as a tool, not just as a rock they picked up, uh, but also using them against anvil stones or carrying anvil stones around. So an anvil stone is a secondary rock, typically bigger than the first or typically flat. You put something on it like a nut or a piece of food, and then you use your hammer stone uh, to smash or break that food. And we see that behavior uh, in many different uh, troops of chimpanzees in Africa, as well as in many different species of, mon of monkeys both in uh, Central and South America and Africa as well. So, so by, by anthropological standards, if we apply the same standards to monkeys and the great apes that we apply to human history, then what we say is, what we see here is that monkeys and the great apes have clearly entered the Stone Age. They are using tools to carry about their daily lives. They have preferred tools, they have preferred shapes of tools, and they use them repeatedly. Okay, so in this, in this way, there are other life forms on Earth that are progressing along the technological evolutionary path that humans tread uh, a million years ago. Okay? Okay, so that's technological intelligence. What about communicative intelligence? Communicative intelligence is really hard to date because there's an extraordinarily lack of physical data. Okay, now if we just look at the physiological record of humans, that is to say, what is the form and function of our bodies through history? If you go back two, two and a half million years along the genus Homo, which includes Homo sapiens, modern humans, but also our predecessors, two, two and a half million years ago, we had developed all of the physiological capability to have vocal language like we do today. That means vocal cords, it means a jaw structure with a tongue, teeth, lips, the whole nine yards that we use today to, to produce the language that we produce. Okay, now um, that physiological structure, uh, many animals produce all kinds of sounds, and here what we're really asking about is do you have um, agreed upon, organized, created sounds that mean something in the same way that when I make a particular sound like star, you know what I mean. I mean shiny bright light up in the sky, okay? So uh, language is what we're really after, but there's no record of spoken language because there's no record of auditory record from a million years ago, right? Uh, but physiologically, we were capable of doing whatever we do today, okay? Now the oldest recorded symbolic writing, so writing is the record of auditory 
language, okay? The oldest recorded symbolic writing that we know of is from the Indus Valley Civilization and also the Rongo Rongo scripts of Easter Island, which date roughly back to the same era, about 5,500 uh, 5, uh, BCE. Um, we'll talk about the Indus Valley uh, Civilization again next time, but um, uh, both of these civilizations clearly use script of some sort. We're not sure that it's a range script or what it is in terms of representation of language because we don't have any way of translating it. We don't know what it means. So it may well be a full-blown writing system, a full-blown language, but we don't know because we don't have any way of understanding what it means. Okay, but that's the oldest record we have, of, uh, the, the oldest known record of symbolic writings. The oldest known understood writing system, where it's clearly an arranged language, where there's clearly a symbolic uh, um, a methodology to the way that language is recorded and it's repetitive, um, is the cuneiform, which arose in Mesopotamia uh, from about 3400 BC. And this uh, picture here is an example of a cuneiform uh, tablet. Okay? Okay. Now, Humans, uh, again, are not the only communicative species on the planet. Uh, there certainly are lots of examples of at least auditory communication that we hear. Uh, those of you who have the opportunity to go out walking around right now, it's spring, early summer, we certainly hear lots of bird song, and birds have lots of different calls they make uh, to communicate with each other, what they're saying with each other, ornithologists certainly speculate about, but we don't know for sure. Uh, but there are other examples of this. And so the example that I'd like to talk about today is uh, whales. So uh, as we said, lots of animals have many vocalizations, uh, in particular birds, cats, dogs, we're all used to those sorts of things. Um, but no animal has a language that we understand as such. Now, this, this statement is, is probably, mm, let's say it's debatable because there certainly are animals that have very wide ranges of sounds that they have. Dolphins are one example. Uh, uh, very wide range of different sounds that they make. They make the same sounds over and over again. They repeat them in different ways. And to say that they don't have a language, I think is a little bit presumptuous. I think a better statement to say is if they do have a language, we don't understand what it is because we haven't figured out a translation for it. It's the same story that we just told with the scripts of Easter Island and the Indus Valley Civilization. Okay, but with whales in particular, uh, whales do have very complex vocalization. If you interpret it musically, it's extraordinarily complex, uh, as complex as any music that, that humans may write. They do repeat it, they do it at certain times of the year, in certain places, uh, in most baleen species, I think only the males sing it. Um, and so whale song is, uh, is a really good example of something that's extraordinarily complex that the whales use um, and we as humans just can't understand. We're trying to understand. So uh, I have two examples of it here. Uh, if you go to that Wikipedia page that I have listed there on the bottom, there's a whole library of whale song. Um, there's many famous books and many famous recordings of whale song that uh, you can get. But if you want a, just a long list of different ones to listen to, you can certainly go to that uh, Wikipedia page. But let me play two separate whale songs here for you so you can hear the difference and you can also hear the complexity. Okay, so the first one is from an orca. So orcas are uh, what we call toothed whales. Uh, dolphins are another example of a toothed whale. Uh, so there's kind of two, two, separate, uh, two separate branches of whales. There's the toothed whales, dolphins, orcas, things like that. And then there's what are called the baleen whales. And so that's things like minke whales, humpback whales, and the blue whales, which we have down here. Okay, and along both branches, the whales uh, do sing. So I'm going to play this here. Uh, hopefully it will uh, be picked up by the speakers, uh, but if you go to that Wikipedia page, you can see examples of this. So let's listen to the Orca, Orca song first. Okay, so you can hear 
chirps, you can hear whistles, things that sound like creaks, right? So it's, it's complex, it's different. They put them in different orders. If you go listen to a long list of them, you'll hear very different ones from many different, uh, uh, different individuals and different species. There's multiple subspecies of, of orcas. So now the next one is for a blue whale and you'll notice it sounds very different. Okay, so that's a, an example of the blue whale song. And so in all of these cases, um, they are different in their construction. They are different in terms of the frequencies, that is the pitch of the sound that they use. Um, that is partly physiological, but clearly they can control the frequency in exactly the same way that you and I control the frequency of our uh, voices when we sing them. Uh, or when we sing them, when we speak. Um, but the, uh, the uh, um, um, physiological differences don't necessarily make up for the fact that the language is really complex, that it, the complexity of the song is clearly originating with the species itself. It chooses what to do. And so this is part of our reason that we regard this as a communicative form of intelligence. And as I said, we clearly don't understand it. Now that, that will be a little distressing to us because these are creatures here on our own planet that we've lived with for hundreds of thousands of years, and we don't understand them. But you and I are talking about searching for life elsewhere on some other planet, which we have no common basis of existence with, and hoping that we might understand it. And we'll come back to that point a little bit later uh, in the week and probably next week we'll discuss it a lot about what is it do we think we should talk about so that we might have a chance of understanding each other. And those, those things that we talk about, talking about with our communication with extraterrestrial intelligences are not the things we think about trying to communicate when we try and talk with whales and dolphins. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say in this half of the lecture. We'll come back and talk about some uh, the other half of the challenges in the next half of today's lecture. So I hope you're all doing well. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you again soon. Okay.